Hello, we are back to you live and we have a great opportunity to meet uh, some of our business leaders in the community. Uh, this is Pivoting Your Business, what some local businesses have done to Hello. change their practices we are back to adjust to, to our circumstances. Yeah. A great opportunity to meet uh, some of our business leaders in the community. Uh, this All is right, um, we're going to do a quick introduction. We've got Sean Ash from Smart Bar. Uh, uh, sorry, from Farm Bar. We've got Michael Caramagno from Caramagno and Associates, uh, Corey Babre from Theater in the Dark, and Christine Forrester from SmackDab. And I am going to start off with why don't I? start with Sean. Um, Sean, can you hear me there? Yep, I can hear you. Great. Um, you've almost completely changed your business model. How has offering alternative services uh, helped get through this tough time? Uh, it's really helped. <clears throat> Obviously, traditional restaurant margins are really, really slim, um, which I'm sure Christine can relate to. Uh, we were able and looking at how grocery stores price out their items, we've turned our dining room into a small market where you can get uh, produce, dry goods, uh, some simple grocery items like beer and wine. Uh, it's helped us, uh, I actually pulled the numbers uh, a ton today. Uh, uh, currently to date, 22% of our net sales since uh, the lockdown started has come from the market, being uh, liquor, beer, wine, flour, potatoes, tomatoes, um, and traditionally, you know, in a restaurant, like between 25 and 30% is where you want to be on uh, food costs. So this has al allowed us to pay for a lot of our, uh, produce, all of our products coming in so we can focus the money, the reduced money that's coming in on labor and, and bills. So, uh, it's really, really helped us out. Great. Um, Corey, uh, for you. Uh, you're just finishing up with your first virtual theater production. Yes. Um, how did you go from pivoting from a live stage setting to online? Yeah, it was a really interesting and intensive process. Uh, and a lot of the hurdle was figuring out how to translate the tech side of it. So we presented uh, with Theater in the Dark a noir mystery that was entirely in the pitch black at the church on Thorndale um, last Halloween. And so uh, obviously the, the theater and the performing arts are, have been just completely devastated. Uh, and even after things get back to quote unquote normal, there's a question of, well, how are perform uh, live performing artists going to continue to generate revenue for themselves? Um, a lot of us are contractors and not employees. So they're, uh, um, it's a question of then taking the work that we've already created and pivoting into an online medium. And because this show is in the dark and leaned heavily on radio dramas as sort of influence of the 30s and 40s, we thought, oh, well, what a great way. Let's take this story and try to translate it into the digital world for the 21st century technology. So so we did the same show, same actors, uh, uh, the soundscape that I created, we converted into an all uh, stereo instead of 360 degree um, live soundscape. Uh, and then we performed it through a live Zoom meeting where uh, uh, the audience's mics and cameras were turned off, but you could still see everybody there in the um, meeting. And we had our actors broadcasting live from across Chicago. Um, so like I said, I'll, uh, it helped that we had the content, but it was also just a question of figuring out how to make the tech work for us um, when we're so used to being in the room with audiences. Excellent. Um, Christine, uh, you've come up with some really creative ways to maneuver this crisis. Um, what were the first changes that you made and then how have those changes evolved? Well, obviously the biggest change was the door shut. It was like Willy Wonka, you know, it's like no one ever comes in, no one ever comes out. And I think in the first, I, I'm sure everyone can attest, like the first month was really quite stressful because we weren't sure what the risks were, right? We were like, oh my God, can anyone come within 10 feet of the business? Can it, can we, how are we doing this? And so there was this extra element, um, kind of a fear on top of at change. So whereas before SmackDab was really known for that really personal service, you know, there's like often lots of hugging during the day, you know, there's lots of like loving consensual touches. And so that immediately kind of left. But I think for the, us, the biggest shift was 
going from that really in-person service to how do we transmit the same level of care and love and presence without any um, any physical uh, di like closeness at all, like the proximity. So now people are a little more comfortable, right, with coming in. We have a contactless pickup area um, and we've worked it out. You know, it's perfect. And, you know, now that we know more about how the virus actually spreads, I think there's more of an ability to like not feel so fearful. But there was that was the big shift was really just how do you maintain the essence of your business when the essence of your business is giving people that in-person sort of experience. Um, excellent. Um, Sean, uh, going back to you, uh, when we uh, spoke earlier in the week, um, you had mentioned that you were reaching out to other businesses, trying to get uh, other neighborhood employees involved. Um, how did you do that? And uh, how is that working for you? Uh, so currently, uh, we I reached out to some of the neighboring bars. <clears throat> I had shifts to fill. They have no shifts to give. Um, so we had a great, me and uh, some of the other business owners have great relationships there. I said, I can give them some hours uh, until you guys can reopen. And it's been a really positive experience. Um, at least the employees are super grateful, even, you know, just for the opportunity. A lot of them have had problems flying, filing for unemployment haven't received any assistance so far. Uh, so it's been been really uh, some sort of positive through all this. Sure. Um, and Corey, uh, what was the response to your first digital production? Did you did you have good attendance? Did is this something you yeah. up continue? Yeah, it's um and, and part of this experiment with us doing a limited two weekend run. And I saw that um Troy in the audience was actually one of our attendees on May 14th. So thank you for coming out. Um but what we found was that there we did Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, but a lot of people um it was a question of shifting our target market. We're normally, of course, going for theater goers, but we found with this, we're also reaching people that enjoy storytelling, um, but that one right now can't go out. And two, um, allowing people to interact in their own home while listening to the show. We recommended people create a, a dark, cozy environment, but some people we know listen to, uh, uh, or like we're washing dishes during the show. Other people were relaxing on their couch with their pets. So, you know, I mean, uh, uh, it's a question of I think people really responded one to the live element and not having a recording or a podcast, but something that was there. And the two people um, mm -hmm. seem to indicate that that could be something uh, they would subscribe to. Certainly that's not unheard of. And so now we're thinking as theater makers, how do we create something that might be more sustainable in a digital format uh, and be able to reach people from where they are. And now the conversation for us is, well, what about people that couldn't tune in? Could we somehow now take what we have as far as the recordings and get that out to folks? And actually, I did want to mention, we just got that on this morning. So we're leaving it up for one week. If anybody here wanted to uh, uh, see what we were doing or hear what we were doing, I should say, you can check it out at theaterinthedark.com slash broadcast. And that'll be up for one week for our show uh, for the last two weeks. Excellent. We'll put that in the chat so folks can find you. Um, Michael, for you, um, for your business, it's more about helping other businesses change and pivot. Um, what can you tell us about what's going on with the accounting practices and, and the loan processes and such? Yeah, Andrew, uh, it's definitely been an interesting experience since tax season uh, was sort of interrupted by this COVID-19 shutdown. Um, there has been a lot more uh, legislation and a lot fewer tax returns. And so uh, so we, um, we've we tried to, uh, to pivot in the sense of, you know, assisting people with the new PPP loans, the EIDL loan process, um, and all those items. And uh, and give them instruction on how to obtain those those government services. Um, a lot of them have never applied for a government program or government loan before, so it's all new territory to them. So we did a lot fewer tax returns this season with the deadlines extended and, and a lot more uh, loan assistance and budgeting and things of that nature. Excellent. Um, Christine, so I know that you, I heard that you started a frequent flyer type program uh, for customer retention. Um, what else have you done to keep your loyal customers coming back? Well, we have had, so we've had, like what I feel very 
I guess, lucky and privileged with is that we had had a lot of this in the making. Like we have been running our own delivery service with our own drivers for three years because we were like, we did the math, third party didn't work, right? So now you hear all this shit. Grubhub and you know, oh, it's appalling. Like, oh yeah, any restaurant knows like, and we were like, we can do better. So in addition to that, we run our own, yeah, we run our own um, loyalty program and we do like a lot of discounts. And during this, for example, we moved to all 99 cent delivery. Um, I also moved onto a, a platform that I love called Active Campaign. Um, it's very in depth, but I'm someone who's not very technologically, um, inclined and I can use it for what I need to. So there's a lot of um, more complex email that you can do. You can send out emails when it's the most likely someone's gonna read it. And so we've been developing um, a pretty good relationship with our customers for years. Like I love writing the emails. It's my favorite part of the week. Like, and it feels very personal. And that's really been helpful, right? Because a lot of restaurants or a lot of businesses hadn't built a lot of that community, one-on-one -on -one community. And now it's like, this is why you want to do that because you don't want to try to do it when you're in a, an emergency. You want to be really in tune with the community at all times because when something happens, then it turns up they're really going to show up. They're used to looking at our Instagram. They're used to looking at the emails. Or you, like, you know, I've gotten that Pavlovian response. Um, so I would say like in general, just even if it's starting small, some regular contact that people can kind of get into a routine with so they know to look from you, right? You don't only want to get an email from a business when they're desperate for your business. <laughs> That's like a hard thing to be, you know, like it to be in. So I would say that um, I do that and it's a lot of it, it's very um, arbitrary. That's part of the difficulty with right now. It's like, I just know when I want to send something out, I say, I feel like people could really use a coupon right now. So I send out a coupon because I'm the boss. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And uh, Sean, that uh, leads me to a question for you. You've also taken a, a most of your business practices online with um, a store as well as your menu. What, what, what was that process? Uh, so luckily we have a great POS system called Toast. Uh, it is super easy for me to manage my entire online ordering delivery platform. I can set my own radius for how far I want my drivers to go how long the tickets are going to take for the kitchen to produce, how long that drive is going to take. Um, I've also been able to build out a 24 hour ordering uh, platform through it um, that I can, again, manage all of my inventory. I can put quantities in. So if things sell out overnight, I don't have to worry about not having uh, the items to fulfill the orders. Uh, the uh, neighborhood customers have been so great. I have like weekly customers putting in $200 grocery orders every Saturday. Um, you know, they, the neighborhood's super great and we are really fortunate. Our, th our first birthday, our one year anniversary was on Tuesday. So, um, you know, we're just really grateful to be here. Uh, also, you know, <clears throat> people want to plan ahead. So the fact that they could purchase their dinner for Thursday and schedule it for a 7 PM delivery, um, and we're offering free delivery at the moment, they, uh, are really taking advantage of that and it helps us plan out. Uh, the day. That's a heck of a way to start your first year. <laughs> um, Michael, a question for you. Um, what are some things that you feel the businesses should prepare for, or should know going forward, uh, especially with these new changes in the loans? Yeah, so Andrew, I think there's a couple of things that businesses should be looking at right now. And um, the first one is just to make sure they're keeping up on the legislation. Uh, for our clients, we've been sending out a lot of client alerts um, at, at least once a week, um, if not a couple times a week, to give people updates on legislation and uh, you know what is going on as far as the programs and the changes to those programs. Um, it, just today, there was a change to the PPP loan program. Uh, potentially, the House has passed a bill that would change the limitation for the payroll costs on that loan program for forgiveness from 75 to 60 percent. And it would also extend the window that you could use the loan from eight weeks to 24 weeks. Uh, and obviously, that still has to pass the Senate and be signed by the president. Um, but the expectation is there will be some compromise that's close to this bill that was passed today that will, again, make changes to the PPP loan program. A lot of people already have those loans. So making sure you're staying up to date on, on the current rules uh, is really important. And then the second thing would be, again, staying current, but just keeping your bookkeeping uh, up to date. Lots of small businesses, you know, that's not a priority necessarily. Uh, and day to day, it's not a huge issue. But a lot of these programs are going to be dependent on 
current impact of the COVID-19 crisis and how it has impacted your business financially. And so to show those declines in revenue that will make you eligible for these programs, you're gonna need current books. And so just making sure people understand that, that current bookkeeping is uh, more important now than it ever has been in the past. And Michael, I have a question from uh, the viewers. Uh, what percentage of your clients applied for PPP and how many of them received it? Yeah, so as far as uh, percentage of the clients that applied, for us, we focus on small businesses almost exclusively. And so it was almost all of our clients. Um, I, I think you asked how many received funds. Um, if, if that's the case, then uh, almost all of them have received funds now. We have a couple of people who are still working through the process who started a little later, but we were very successful in getting people funds, uh, whether it was through the large banks or uh, community banks or online lenders, uh, with, with maybe three exceptions right now, which were almost closed on those three. Every one of our clients who wanted a loan received a loan. That's fantastic. Um, Sean, we have a question for you. Will Farm Bar continue the marketplace uh, when the city begins to allow outdoor seating? Uh, yes, so we're definitely gonna still allow that. Uh, we've gone through great lengths to figure out how we're gonna implement uh, sanitation practices that make not only our staff feel safe and our guests, um, but that just uh, really, you know, as contact free and as friendly as we can be. But uh, the idea is that as guests arrive and we will be reservation only, that they'll still have the opportunity to walk through the marketplace and everyone will be able to access through their phones the online ordering system when they walk, uh, sit down at their tables in the back patio and they can order items from the market right at their table and we can pack it up and have it ready to go uh, when they're ready to leave. Um, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, Corey, Stephanie had asked you in the chat um, mm -hmm. if you charged or, and you said uh, you were recommending $10, but it was pay what you can. What was the response? Yeah, we um, we knew that we were going to be reaching out to a bunch of different types of folks. I mean, we had students uh, that obviously are in a very tight situation situation financially. Period. Um, we had our nor uh, some people that came to see the show when it was live. Also, we had audiences reaching from literally Vancouver to Atlanta to London, and of course everywhere in between. So, um, in terms of seeing what people would, we didn't want to put a minimum price tag on it to scare people away because um, sometimes that can happen. But we did recommend because there was a, we wanted to deliver a, as high a value as we could. And I think we definitely delivered a, a well above a $10 ticket price. But we had some people that were willing to give much more. Um, some families actually that bought multiple tickets, even though they were only listening from one device. And so uh, part of maybe just trying to capture a bit of that live element was giving some people some choice in how they engaged with the content. Um, and But we found that people were really receptive. And we did create an option at the end of every show to direct people back to our website if they um, um, got, say, a free ticket and then wanted to make a donation at the end of the show. Excellent. Uh, Michael, we have another question from Stephanie. Uh, with the changes that are happening to the PPP program and rules um, now, will that impact people who have already received their loans or is that only going to apply people with new loans? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, most of the changes here are retroactive. And the reason for that is because they this program was rolled out so quickly that they didn't really have rules in place when they made the loans initially. So a lot of these rules are after the fact when if there wasn't the urgency, they would have made these up front. Uh, the only rule I've seen, uh, the rule change so far that I've seen that wouldn't apply to existing loans would be the change in the bill that was passed today, which is, to be clear, not legislative, uh, not, not official legislation yet. It hasn't been passed by the Senate or signed by the president, but um, that changed from two years to five years for the loan duration. That change specifically would only apply to new loans. All other changes um, are retroactive to all loans as part of the PPP program. Okay, now I'm gonna open up a couple general questions for the whole entire group. Um, and this is the, the, the candid, admit your mistakes, lessons learned portion. Um, what have you tried that didn't work? Uh, any platforms or systems that just didn't take off that you could advise other business owners to avoid or do differently? I guess I could say first, um, we debated a lot on, uh, uh, of course we're delivering an audio adventure, but we 
still had patrons that were expecting some kind of video element. And so um, as we went through, we definitely had to adjust a lot of our language in terms of setting audience expectations. And then even though, of course, we didn't have video, we ended up incorporating even a blank slide so that we could take as much control over people's screens for the, the smaller percentages of audiences that weren't able to have that. And would spend the first 15 minutes of the show calling us frantically saying, my video isn't working. And we said, no, 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 that's intentional. So that's definitely something uh, uh, with its a new experience for audience members, for sure. Sure, and Christine? I would say, well, it's interesting because I would say managing expectations is a big one. Um, contactless delivery is really confusing for some people. Like. <laughs> throwing the door wide open without a mask on. They're like, I'm here. And you're like, that's not contactless delivery. So I think not to be blithe, but like, right, for so many people, online ordering is a new thing. Pre-ordering is a thing, like technology is not accessible. They're not learned. So I don't even know so much that it didn't work. I just think as we try to figure out and maybe Sean has thoughts as well, right? When you are in, you're bringing this to an audience that might interact with your brand and your business very differently, to be compassionate, but also really firm. Like, no, our delivery drivers can't make an exception and come right to your door in the 30 tower high rise, right? And 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 having it be an empowering thing, right? And and always going back to like, actually, we're protecting our staff. It's not, it is about the customer, but it isn't about you to the point where we, we can put our staff at risk. So that I think in general, as you explain to people like, hey, this is a COVID style, rollout like for the most part to sean's point everyone has been a peach for the most part but then you do get people who are projecting a lot of that fear and the uncertainty onto you in the business and it's just being really clear about what you're willing to do and what you can do and what you can't do especially as we move into this weird middle ground where like we're open but we're not open and how and saying what is best for me and my staff and what is really what can we offer without putting ourselves at risk? So that's what I'd say is the biggest sort of hurdle to get through. Sean? Yeah, Christina, I think you make great points. I think, like you said, managing expectations, educating the customer about what's safest for them and making it feel like a, that you're going through all of this to make them as safe as possible, you, you know, a lot of these curbside pickups, they're not sure what curbside pickup involves. Um, so just having a very clear cut uh, uh, pre-written speech that you have for your staff that uh, all you do is uh, call on arrival, let us know if you're walking up or you're in a vehicle and let us know the model. And then also for like taking credit card payments over the phone and, and asking those awkward conversations about, do you want to add a gratuity to your check? Because they don't have, you know, we're not, we're giving the option not to sign on arrival. Um, so it's about, you know, understanding people's, what they can process in like a single interaction. And then hopefully it's a good interaction so that the next one's even easier. Um, but even like the, we have the market, the face masks in the store, you know, it's a lot of people walking in, opening the doors saying, hi, I don't have a face mask. Like, you know, it's an education. And uh, Michael, for you, uh, are there any mistakes that you've seen your clients make? You mentioned bookkeeping before, but uh, anything that you've witnessed that's a recurring problem that uh, you could advise against? I think the bookkeeping is the main one, just people getting an understanding of, of how important keeping that current is. Um, and then, you know, I saw it in my practice. We, we were mostly remote capable, and uh, I'm lucky to be in an industry that transitions pretty easily to remote work. We already had cloud-based software. Um, almost all of our systems were cloud-based, so we do very little on paper. Um, so we were lucky in that sense, but it did change the way we interacted with staff and um, you know, assigned work and things like that that made for a little bit of a, a couple of hiccups in the transition process. Um, but other than that, I, I think from a client perspective, you know, up to, to, to beat the drum here, updated books is the, is the big sell, yeah. True. Sure. Well, I want to thank all of you for taking your time out to be with us today. Um, I appreciate you being here and for what you've passed on to us. Um, and if you have any more questions for these speakers, please go ahead and reach out in the chat feature, or you can reach out to us and we'll get you in touch. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.